so yeah, if you want to like just start this thing off, give a little bit about yourself, how you came to be Guru Viking, and then we can get the ball rolling and get into it. Yeah, well, of course, you found me through the podcast, Guru Viking podcast. Mm -hmm. And that is um, conversations, I suppose, or interviews, not really conversations, it's more one way, uh, interviews with interesting people of all kinds, focus a lot on uh, Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but not only, also had uh, uh, people from other traditions there and, uh, and so on. Uh, but yeah. as for how I became Guru Viking, you know, how I started doing this, yeah, I mean, gosh, that's a very broad question. I should have really thought this through. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just do the things that I find interesting. You know, I teach meditation. I run all kind of workshops. Um, my business partner is a woman called Michaela Bowen, who's a quite well-regarded relationship uh, counselor, among other things. So we do workshops to do with trauma. We do workshops to do with relationship stuff, um, as well as the more spiritual end of things, mm -hmm. movement, uh, embodiment, um, uh, uh, meditation, uh, sexuality and relationships and so on uh, these mm -hmm. sorts of things I also have a private client um, practice which uh, focuses on uh, I suppose you could say um, the same areas more or less mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah personal development spiritual development yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how long have you been teaching meditation gosh oh um, uh, many years several years now um, yeah, long many time. Years. Long yeah time. <laughs> quite, quite quite a while. Yeah. yeah I've been yeah. doing it a long time and it's just one of my passions. You know, it's a part of what I do. I mean, it's the thing, if you come to guruviking.com, you'd see a lot of that. It would look like perhaps that I'm mainly a meditation teacher. Yeah. Uh, that's because a lot of the other work I do is referral based and I don't, it's not really, um, I don't advertise a lot of it. Uh, although the work I do with Michaela is on michaelabone.com. Uh, our workshops together are there, but uh, the private client stuff is, is mostly referral based. And so guruviking.com itself is mainly a, a platform for the podcast and for my meditation teaching activities. Although in truth, that's only a real sliver of what I do professionally. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. I see that your meditations are um, up to, I've, I've seen ones that are like three hours long, right? Yeah. Yeah. The three, four hours long. Yeah. I like to do that. That sort of a uh, length sometimes. Yeah. How often? Um, well, there's no number, right? It's like whenever you kind of feel it type of thing. Yeah. I mean, the, I have a regular, my regular practice is not that length. Mm -hmm. And so I have a regular daily practice, which is much less than three or four hours. And then from time to time in either because I'm in a sort of retreat context, so I'm doing a lot more practice uh, and I might, then I'll of course do longer sits might do say a week of, you know, if I'm also working, I might decide to do a week of extra practice, maybe do three, four hours sits every day for a week, maybe something like that. Or if I'm doing some sort of a longer retreat, several weeks, I might do chunks of two hour sits or three hour sits, something like that, three, four hour sits. Mm -hmm. So in a retreat situation, I'll do more or just occasionally if I you know, have, have a spare afternoon and I feel like it, then yeah, then I just do a little, little extra. You know. <laughs> if you could explain to somebody who maybe they've meditated once or twice, they sat in a room with their eyes closed for five or 10 minutes. If you could explain to somebody like that or to nobody or to somebody that's never meditated, why or what you get from doing two to three hour meditations um, and you know, what it really does for your being, how would you explain that to somebody? Yeah. I mean, it does seem like an awfully long time, um, but people sit in long haul flights for similar amounts of time. Or if you watch the Lord of the Rings movies, you'll be there for three, four hours. <laughs> yeah. I remember mm -hmm. when I watched the third one, I was so engrossed. I was a boy, of course, when the third one came out, Return of the King. And I was so engrossed in it that I, when I kind of emerged from the end of that really long film with many endings, it's got six endings, that film, <laughs> uh, I was desperate for the toilet, but I just didn't no notice that how desperate I was to go to the toilet. Of course, everyone in the theater at the same time had that same realization. So there's this huge queue, you know, this uh, sort of a uh, middle earth size queue uh, because I was so absorbed. So, and actually, I think it's also the case that, um, you know, musicians sometimes practice three, four hours, two, three, four hours. 
uh, you know, you, you might do all kind of activities, read a book, uh, etc. So I think in that sense, if, if you're used to anything, let's take meditation, then practicing for that length of time, of course, it's absurd to think of that at the beginning, but as you get on, you do it for a long period of time. Yeah, of course, just like a guitar player or piano player might practice for that length of time, not at the beginning, but later on in their, in their playing trajectory. It's not so wild to do it. Um, my, one of my main, main meditation teachers is Shinzen Yang, and he's an American meditation teacher. And he really emphasizes uh, those longer sits. He calls them strong determination sits. Sort of four hours is about the, about the kind of template for that. And so you're asking, uh, and lots of people that study with him do it. So it's definitely not an Olympic level length of time to be meditating. Mm -hmm. And just because you're sitting there for four hours, of course, over the years, my body's gotten used to sitting in the meditation position and I've gotten used to sitting still. So it's not as much of a struggle for me as it would be for someone who wasn't used to the position. Yeah. So if you look at it and say, wow, he's sitting for a long time and he's not moving for hours, that's, that's impressive because you're thinking, well, could you do it? Well, yeah. not right now, but if you <laughs> did a little bit of practice each day and your body got used to the position, then yeah, you'd be really surprised that you could do it as well. Not you, Gary, I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the person who thinks it's a long time. Yeah. It's not that difficult. Mm -hmm. as, as it looks there are people who do sits for long like eight hours i you know can't imagine all that yeah so having contextualized it yeah there's three ways to uh if you want stretch your or um yeah like uh, improve your or uh, let me think not not quite test but to stress your practice one is duration sit longer frequency sit more often or we're talking about meditation now, or intensity. Impose some sort of intensifying condition on the practice. For instance, not moving at all, not, not even to scratch your nose or, uh, for example. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so, you know, some people will do things like meditate in very cold temperatures or mm -hmm. you know, go into a cave or sit you know, with fires at the four compass points and sit in the middle and it's very hot. I mean, you know, I'm not, it, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, uh, or they'll, you know, yeah, things like that. So, uh, of course, so in that sense, when you sit longer, um, it puts a bit of stress on your practice and uh, you eventually run out of coping strategies. You eventually run out of tricks, usually, and um, you get, eventually get past your, um, if you want, yeah, ability to hold it together just just by cruising and you really have to apply what happens you get sometimes you get physical pain mm -hmm. and so then you have to work with physical pain sometimes you get psychological or emotional discomfort just because you're sitting there for a long time not doing anything there can be an, a, a a real sense of oh, i've got to get up and do something right yeah you know, agitation mm -hmm. uh sometimes especially if you're doing regular sits you can emotional material can come up you can feel you know whatever fear or sadness or you can feel angry maybe you have a memory from the past the body kind of can release and digest these things so that can become quite intense and of course that that doesn't always happen sometimes you sit there and it's just very nice and blissful and relaxed mm -hmm. and so it's just like any practice if you what four hours gives you over say half an hour is more time to apply the practice yeah so it's the same thing if you practice guitar for half an hour versus four hours. You've just got more practice time. You can cover more ground, um, et cetera. Mm. So it's, I, I would look at it really rather mechanically in that way. Yeah, it is. It, is. it seems just like um, – I, I like how you mentioned like playing an instrument because I think it is. I also – have some skill in playing some guitar and, you know, on the piano a little bit. And, and I, there are times where I get into this – zone i guess you could say in the zone as they say and it seems almost like a meditative state where i come out of it and i'm just like what what time is it like what where did my mind just go there and it seems like when like it could be an instrument it could be painting a picture or it could be uh riding a dirt bike whatever it is that brings you closer to the moment and it seems just like it, it um we just our mind is just so focused on this one thing whatever it is it just I don't know what it, it's the same thing as meditation in a way. It's just like, I don't know how to explain it, man. It's just like, um, 
it brings you closer to our like your true essence in a way it's a it's it's the same it has to be i don't know i'm not a neurologist but it has to be the same like touching on the same neurons in our brains like meditation and because i don't think in order to reach that state right the state of meditation is it's, it's pretty much like a state of peace a state of uh just oneness with the universe or just connection i don't think you need to sit for three hours i think it can also come down to like whatever your purpose is on in this life it could be cooking like i said before painting a picture whatever it is but i think as long as you reach that connection and you can reach that kind of um other mind state i think that's all that matters and what you said before is it really just comes down to discipline because you know i could look at your three-hour videos and be like <laughs> no way jose and then i could also look at carlos santana on stage you know just ripping it back in the 60s and i'm also like no way but if i just Mm -hmm. if i just dedicated myself to guitar i maybe might be able to be like carlos santana i don't know maybe get close or i could also dedicate myself to meditation like you and sit down for the three hour sits so it's it's in that same vein it really is it's just knowing how to work with the mind and know what you you're I don't even want to say purpose, but like what, what brings you closer to essentially the present moment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you're, I think you're quite right about a lot of that. Meditation, there's many different techniques and many different purposes why people meditate. So I guess when you see someone sitting there meditating, you don't know what they're doing. You know, they might, <laughs> might just be thinking about zo- like zoning out or something, right? Mm-hmm. Or they, which is, there are certain techniques like that. Or, or maybe they're concentrating on their breath, for example, and trying to bring about a unification of the mind where the attention is sort of coming, uh, all the distractions eventually become worked through and the, you can become much more concentrated and have what they call unification of mind. Or, or there can be techniques where you try to see how reality works and you notice things like how sensations always seem to be changing or coming and going or pulsing and throbbing. You start to pay attention to certain qualities of sensations. There's sorts of techniques like that. And there's techniques where you try to make yourself feel really good states and you really bask in feelings of love or feelings of friendliness or feelings of, like you said, peace or well-wishing for others, you know, or you're praying to God or uh, this sort of idea. So all these sort of contemplative techniques, they're quite diverse. There's a few things they have in common. They're deliberate use of the attention. Mm. You're kind of using it in a certain way, but using it in different ways for the different techniques. Yeah. It's a little yeah. bit, I sometimes think of it a little bit like exercise. If you do a heavy squat program or a heavy weight training program, uh, that's one kind of, that's exercise. But so is going for a jog or a marathon training is also exercise. And they have certain things in common because they're both exercise and there are certain overlaps. But if you follow the path of heavy weightlifting, you'll have typically tend to have a certain developmental trajectory versus if you follow the path of jogging or, mar- or long distance running, for example, both are fit people, but in different ways, both is exercise, but the result is different. The development is different. The goals are related, but different. I think it's true also for meditation techniques. There's so many of them. That's one of the reasons I find it so fascinating because it's, yeah. like, po- it's like Pokemon. <laughs> so many different kinds. <laughs> That's true. And what are we all chasing with all these kinds? You think it's just some kind of connection? Like are we just find, trying to find liberation, like some kind of peace in that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, it seems to be one of humankind's great hobbies, doesn't it? Yeah. To tinker with their human experience and to explore different ways of tracing the contour of sensory experience, etc. Of mm-hmm. course, the, the religious and traditions where a lot of these contemplative techniques are housed or, or, or uh, transported through time in, in these traditions have their ideas, don't they? Like trying to become closer with God, becoming intimate with God, or liberating oneself from suffering, extinguishing you know, suffering or getting out of the wheel of rebirth or even becoming enlightened so you can help everyone else get enlightened and, you know, that sort of thing, you know, they, they all have different ideas, don't they, of, mm. of what, what they're, what they're, they're different conceptual expressions of what they're after. But what's the ultimate? Yeah, it's hard to say, isn't it? People have speculated about that, of course, try to say, well, it's all roads up the same mountain, in which case what's at the top of the mountain is what you're asking. And I don't know. Mm. I think the all, I don't know, for me, it seems like connection, 
Uh, but hmm. it's like, cause every, all of these belief systems stress, um, just being a good person, essentially. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't matter if you like Buddhism with the meditating or the, the yogic practices or Christianity, whatever it is, they all say, be a good person. Like whatever the practice is, you know, praying, doing yoga poses, meditating for three hours, uh, going to church, something, but I don't think like all the rituals, I don't think really matter as much as the message and the message is just, um, we're all the same thing. Just be a little nicer, like compassion, you know, meta, uh, just we're, you know, we're all brothers and sisters here on this planet. So let's just treat each other a little bit better. I think that's, I don't know if that's the goal, but that seems to be, um, the message of what these, religions are and um i don't know that's just how i interpret everything else i mean i, I like to read into all of the uh, the holy books and just kind of entertain the ideas uh but really nothing really sticks with me other than just be a good person in this life <laughs> you know it's just just love people compassion see others as you see yourself it sounds cliche but it is true i mean it's just uh, we, we do this all all of these practices that we just talked about all everything else whatever it is that brings you close to the moment essentially i think we do it just to uh to be a better person to, like to grow and through our growth hopefully we grow um so others can grow with us and we essentially create a better world from that i think that's kind of what the message is and what why we're doing all of these practices is so we can just become a better being not only for ourselves but collectively as well Mm-hmm. yeah i don't know that's just how i see it man i think that i like that view i like that view. i think that's just like we're all we're all just chasing that same dream of uh i don't know if it's a dream but just uh trying to just be better <laughs> just because we're human beings are so uh i don't know if you say flawed but we are we're just flawed beings from birth from our conditioning from our Maybe, uh, you know, people say our DNA is imprinted from generations and past lifetimes and past incarnations. We're clearing up our past karma, whatever it is, we're, we're, we're not perfect beings. And I think through all of these rituals and practices that we have, we're trying to almost, it seems like, purify ourselves through, our, um, through these rituals and practices. And uh, it's an it's a ongoing process it's a, it's a, in the human life. And um, yeah what's at the top of the mountain freedom liberation maybe absolute peace uh but i don't think we're there yet we still have some time to go because <laughs> as a bodhisattva right they say they don't they don't want to get to the top of the mountain unless everybody else is at the top of the mountain because true um true buddhahood right is seeing others as you as you see yourself or you see yourself in others so like how can you you can't just let how do i say this man like i think it's pushing us to grow collectively because collective growth is essentially our own growth like we can't just grow just by ourselves just like just me as gary like we all, all collectively through all of these pursuits we all grow into a greater being that is the human being the race of the human being and where we're going i don't know but I think ideally through these, these holy books and rituals, everything that we do, we are going to get to a better future. That's the mystical message behind the words and behind all the practices. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little optimistic, maybe a little idealistic, but that's just how I kind of see all everything that's written down from thousands of years ago. I think, you know, like the practice of yoga and all of these silent retreats that we go on, everything that we do, it's, it's to purify our soul it's to purify our entire being because we just come from <laughs> unfortunately just such darkness it seems we could we like we come from this like such strife and this is a time like this is the greatest time in human history to be alive to be able to purify our past um flaws or or whatever happened because if you do believe i'm going off on a rant here my bad dude i know i know you might not be able to follow but if you do believe in these past incarnations and we carry the weight of our past incarnations, um, this is the lifetime to purify yourself <laughs> because we have so much at our disposal. We have just, um, just so much knowledge. 
we can reach out. I'm talking to you from across the world. I would have never been able to have this conversation and have this transmission of energy if it was even just 30 years ago, Mm -hmm. 40, maybe on a telephone call, but it's still not the same thing. So what I'm trying to get at is all of our spiritual pursuits and practices um, seem to lead up to this point in time where we have the world's knowledge at our fingertips. And I think this is the point in time where we take all of that knowledge from our past incarnations, whatever it is, um, our ancestors that paved the way for us to become the being that we're supposed to be. And that's a kind, loving, compassionate, um, collective race that is one. Um, and I know I sound that sound like a hippie tangent, but that's... <laughs> that's just i I think what the goal is Mm -hmm. i'm curious i know you're i know you're a yogi uh Mm -hmm. you you mentioned that uh in our email exchange uh i'm curious what what are your influences are in the way you're thinking where you you what Uh, sort of feeding into your your thinking a lot of i watch i just watch a lot of um gurus online like ram das he's one um a lot of spiritual podcasts but ram das is He's up there for me. Um, you know, a lot of like old, I mean, like Ramana Maharshi quotes, um, just people of that caliber. And I can tell that, um, and I've also read a, you know, good amount of sacred texts. And uh, it's just, it's just, I, I'm like a, a melting pot of beliefs and it, it, everything that like it, it's just pointing toward the same thing it's all just love you know it's all just becoming a better person and yeah i guess it's just through my own curiosity to figure out uh what's really going on in this universe and i'm still learning it's i'm still trying to peel back the layers of what it is to be a human being but what's really influenced me is uh just my own meditation man it's just they kind of just I could read so much. I could watch so much other podcasts and other people's videos, but it really just comes down to sitting in a room with your eyes closed and following the breath. (laughs) You'll learn more in 20 minutes of that than you ever will from any kind of uh, media. Honestly, it's just that like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, Steve, it's just dedication. I, I meditate every day as well. I've actually never, I've never done three hours though. I have to get on that. (laughs) I, but it's just dedication and it's just my practice to really um, that really has shed light upon what I am as a person. uh, And then that has shed light upon what everybody else is as a person. And then the spiritual insights that I learn throughout my own yogic practice, um, I see them reflected online and with other people. I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm not crazy. (laughs) There is, it's almost like, I do the practice first and then I go on the computer or whatever on my phone or whatever and read other people having these experiences and same insights that I come to. I'm like, Oh, okay. There is something to these feelings because if I was, um, so like, you know, when you practice yoga and meditation, you come to these like insights that are just, um, I don't know if you do it regularly, it just brings, makes you more peaceful and loving human being. And to see, like I look in your eyes and I see me, You know, I don't see me, Gary Haskins, but I see like a consciousness experience in itself. And that's how I see other people as well. And that's just such a trippy thought, especially to the layman. So, you know, I, I come, I've come to that conclusion of, you know, unity. Right. And it would, it would, it's almost like it would bring me to, I don't know how people did this stuff before the internet and before all of these resources, because I would go, I would probably think I'm crazy. I'm like, why is never like, why are we all not on the same wavelength of just like treating everybody with respect? Because our world is just like not on that wavelength right now. So it's almost like I use these resources of uh, that I have at my disposal, the internet, and kind of like clarify, like, yes, I'm on the right path. Like this is, I have to keep doing my practice. I have to, this is, this is what life is essentially about. It's coming back to that connection in peace and unity. And it's like I said, man, I don't have any rigid practice. It's kind of just like my own smorgasbord of taking something from this philosophy, taking something from this person. I like that, 
ooh, that was a cool insight from this person or something they said was cool and or some kind of practice that I do like Wim Hof breathing, you know, Tuma meditation, uh, Kundalini yoga. Like I just try different things. Like I try psychedelics. I go into, I used to do weekly sensory deprivation tank visits. Uh, I just, I'm into like experimenting with the human condition essentially. And um, yeah, through that has led me to the beliefs that I hold now. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just Amazing. experimentation and curiosity. And that's another thing too, is like, that's what's leading this podcast is by, and probably yours as well too. It's my own curiosity. Like I, I'm genuinely, I was genuinely curious to ask you certain things and to talk to you and all the people as well. And I think that's, um, curiosity really leads the way in like a, in my practice, at least, I don't know about what everybody else's is, but for me, curiosity if you just stay like a, like a child almost and have that childlike curiosity and know that nobody's ever against you in this life and just could just be genuinely like, how can I learn something from this person? Even if they seem like the dumbest person in the world, just be like, how, well, well, how can I better myself from whatever interaction I'm having? Or how can I, you know, like see them in a different light and, you know, like how can I really grow? And that's how I treat, every interaction now with every person and especially when I bring people on here because when I bring people on on the show I say how can I grow and then how can the audience also grow with me so getting back to my original point is curiosity is a very powerful um I guess you could say tenant to have in your disposal because that's how we grow if you're not curious about anything in this life then um you're not really gonna grow because that's that's how we just see light, uh, life in a different light. Like you just, you're like, oh, maybe it could go this way. Ah, I can, or maybe it can't, or it's just continually every day for me is like a new day of trying to take in something that I didn't have before. It's like, um, after you do these, um, practices that I mentioned before and that what yogis do, it's almost like your life becomes some kind of journey. It almost like there is some kind of mission to life. Like before I was kind of um, at a point where, I was, you know, I guess you could just say lost or just kind of like aimless, just going to work for a paycheck and just surviving just so I can eat and just get through the motions of the day. And I, hey, I think that's how most people probably live their life. But I think if you really do these practices that we talked about before and really explore yourself for what you really are, in this incarnation, then you can see that life is more than just like, you know, going through the motions and kind of just surviving that we all, whatever it is, like I said, paint a picture, cook food, make music, whatever it is, we all have a certain purpose and a certain something that we have to contribute. And, excuse me. And, um, yeah, I figured uh, this is my contribution <laughs> through this is just like having these curious conversations with people like you, Steve. That was a very long answer for I did not expect to go off on that much. <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that one. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you always thought like this and, and been like this or were there, were there catalyst events? And I'm also wondering what you were like as a child. How old are you? No. I'm 27 and I was, I'm an only child. So this might be why. <laughs> I am in the position that I'm in right now. Uh, but I've always, I've always had time alone, which is interesting. And I was, uh, I was into martial arts when I was a kid too. So that may, that might've led me down the path somewhat. So just being a only child in that weird path that I think maybe, um, yeah, I, I kind of always been an outside the box thinker, I guess you could say, but I've never been like so weird as in like, who who's this guy? <laughs> but I used to be a um, a person that was very materialist. Uh, one plus one equals two rationale. Mm-hmm. You know, there's obviously no God. Uh, there's, you know, just kind of like this black and white. And then uh, that's when I started to get into like, I guess you could say meditation and the whole like exploring my inner being. And then... I started to kind of peel back the layers 
of the human being and then uh came to where i am right now and there were the catalyst events were probably honestly it was probably doing magic mushrooms it was it helped to me to kind of un unlock something in my brain that i didn't have before like i but um the problem is people do mushrooms and they always try to like chase that with mushrooms that like that kind of feeling of it, all right so it gave me a feeling of uh universal love i guess you could say ultimate unity between all beings uh i felt everybody suffering all at the same time and i was just like oh what can i do i'm like oh well, obviously i have to love people right so it's just like this immense love you know a lot of people go through that experience but i think the problem is people try to chase that experience all the time and they want to feel that love and connection, but it's not really about that. It's about opening the door and seeing what's on the other side of the door. And then from there, you always know what's on the other side. Uh, but if you try to keep going through, it's not going to be the same. It's the same exact message. You know, when you get the message, hang up the phone as Alan Watts said. So I think that experience led me, it was a catalyst that led me down the path of devoted spiritualism. And I mean, having like a discipline, having a sort of practice so that I can touch upon that part of my being that is of that peace and unity and seeing everybody else as myself. Because it's easy as an American or a Western, you know, anyone in the Western world, it's easy for most people to get sucked out of that mindset of uh, that peace, unity, universal consciousness, love, essentially, and seeing others as yourself. So for me at least i'm not speaking for anybody else but for me i need to have that practice to bring me to a state of grounding and bring me back to sanity so i don't have to deal with just the drama of the 21st century lifestyle so yes the, the magic mushrooms and also the cannabis usage um were catalysts but they're not they they weren't something that like um I don't get the same thing from them as I really do from like meditation and yoga and just like dedication to my own personal uh, growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old were you when you had that transformative mushroom experience? Um, I was probably 22, 23, maybe, maybe a little older. It was sometime, it was mid twenties. It was only a few years ago, but after that, I kind of felt um, just like a little lost, I guess you could say, uh, just out of sync. It was just like, whoa, it was just a crazy, crazy experience. But then, you know, it, it happened. And I was feeling like that for a reason because my consciousness experienced something and, and it's almost like uh, it was telling me to like follow this path of, you know, of yoga, essentially just becoming, uh, becoming who I'm supposed to be, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, have you ever had any kind of psychedelic experience? Well, it's illegal here in the UK. It's illegal. Illegal. Yeah. Oh, of course. It's illegal in the U S as well. <laughs> I heard though that they didn't, uh, one state, of course, cannabis is le getting legalized all over the U S yeah. but didn't mm -hmm. also one state legalize magic mushrooms recently. I, did yeah. I that was Oregon. Oregon. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, they, they did it for, um, well, they decriminalized all drugs, which I think that's how it should be. And they also uh, made therapy with psilocybin legal. So, you know, you can't go to a mushroom dispensary yet. <laughs> well, you can, oh, right. Okay. You can, get, uh, you can get like psychotherapy with the aid of psilocybin and um, have like a, I don't know, three to six hour session with it. And it's kind of like a therapy session. Uh, just with mushrooms, which I think mm -hmm. that's kind of how it should be, you know, that's kind of like how I see the correct usage of these substances. Yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating research about that, isn't there, with maps and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, psych psych psychedelic assisted therapy, really interesting area. MDMA, uh, mushrooms, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm curious then if someone was to look, be like a fly on the wall of your routine or your practice what what do you do i mean I, I expect you do postural yoga and you said you do meditation what sort of mm -hmm. technique do you do in your meditation what does it look like 
it's really just simple following the breath. It's um, just sit in a chair, that one that's right behind me. I don't know if you, you can't even see it, but yeah, just sit in a chair or this chair, wherever, it doesn't even matter to be honest with you. And uh, I just follow the breath, just simply, I usually start, it's kind of like a one in, two out. And then once I can get into that rhythm, I can simply just follow the sensations of, uh, you know, the breath coming in through the nostrils or my chest rising and falling. And from there, I just, you know, play the meditation game in your head of going with the flow of your thoughts and just following the inward flow of the breath and following the outward flow. Yeah, and just seeing whatever comes up. And as Ramana Maharshi says, whatever comes, let it come. And whatever goes, let it go. And, and if, see what remains. <laughs> and if thoughts come into your mind when you're focusing on the breath, do you remain focusing on the breath and let the thoughts kind of go on in the background? Or do you relate to them in some way? Do you use them as a meditation object? Hmm. Usually, no, I don't. Um, well, I don't try to resist because that's not, that's not what you do. It's just kind of like a, uh, yeah, just pay, it's just kind of like a TV screen. I, I just pay attention to see what comes up. And then I say, oh, no, back to the breath. And that's what meditation is. It's like kind of like uh, getting to that point of just back to the breath. And it takes me probably about maybe 15, 20 minutes where I can kind of just stop thinking but it's like, all right, so it's like, it goes between points of thoughts, 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 oh, back to breath for maybe mm. 20 seconds, and then thoughts, 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 oh, come back to breath, thoughts, 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 and then, and then as the longer that I go into the meditation, meditation session, that span of time where it's just at the breath elongates after every time um, that I come back to it from um, the, te the television screen of my thoughts. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. So you get drawn into the thoughts or you, you forget about the breath for a moment and you get, mm -hmm. I guess you could say distracted or caught up in the thoughts. And then when you recognize you've been distracted, you come back, come back to the breath yes. and you just repeat, repeat, repeat. And you find that then the thoughts somewhat settle down over time. Exactly. Yeah. Through that repetition, whatever that motion is, like that simple tension it's yeah, it's it. I can eventually get to a point where it's just kind of, I don't know, is that a, a point of samadhi? I don't really know. Is it just a point of really just like bodily sensations? And there's no, like, there's nothing going on other than, I guess, my senses. Uh, but that, like, the those thoughts in my head aren't really there. And it's such a, um, oh, it's so peaceful. But it takes time. Like, I can't, I wouldn't be able to just do that right now. Like, that's not really, it, it takes, that's why, you know, doing like your two hour, three hour sits like you do, I can't imagine the mindsets and mind states that you must, and the peace that you must reach in that. Uh, Cause I, the most that I have ever meditated, it's probably 50 to 60 minutes. And after that, I've just like felt like I went to a different dimension. <laughs> so I can't imagine three hours, man. I definitely have to make time for myself to do that. It's awesome. Yeah. It it's an interesting exploration. It is. I mean, to be honest with you, sometimes in those longer sits, I find myself in deep states or, or something like that, slip into them. But a lot of the times it's pretty surface level consciousness. It does depend a little bit on the technique. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also like to do focus on breath meditation or focus on body sensations. That's sort of the same kind of category. I like to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the practice in those longer sits for me, if I was to say use that kind of a technique, is to uh, maintain the posture, so long spine without collapse, uh, whilst relaxing the body. So everything is really relaxed, but without collapsing. So if you uh. relax too much, the posture practice. So there's a certain sense of lengthening of the spine and relaxing of the body, and then attempting to, as you as you describe, um, settle the attention on the breath or the body sensations. Let's just say the breath. For, so we have one example. And then, yeah, when I get distracted, I come back and it's like that. And uh, eventually what I noticed is that, what I noticed is that as the concentration improves, uh, which isn't, uh, there's a sort of an, a, a, a thin line between trying too hard. I just, I describe it like uh, squeezing soap. 
in the shower. If you hold soap in the shower and you squeeze it too hard, it shoots out. If you don't hold it hard enough, it falls out. Mm. That's not a traditional metaphor. The traditional metaphor is of a guitar string. If you tune it too tight, it snaps, not, no good. If yeah. you tune it too loose, then it's, it kind of flops around, you can't use it. So, uh, and then, you know, gradually as the concentration gets a bit more, you start to catch yourself being distracted a bit sooner. And also the concentration level goes up. I noticed that the sort of thing that would distract me, uh, it still gets me, it still distracts me. But because my concentration is a little bit higher, I'm there for maybe a quarter of a second or a second of material that previously would have tripped my distraction fuse, my switch, you know, but the concentration gets a little bit better. So you, as it gets a little bit better, 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 one can experience more and more of the sort of thing that one would normally be bouncing off into distraction or sucked into into distraction. That's really interesting. Try to see what are the drivers, but but behind that. And then sometimes, if um, you know, on a good day, if I or I get lucky, then the distraction can be the concentration can be really quite um, decent. Then entire weather systems can pass through without pulling me into distraction or bouncing me off into distraction. And then you can experience all weather systems going through the body, whole constellations of, of sensation, of emotion, of memory, of activation in the sensory systems. It all kind of goes on in the, excuse me, in the background. It's very, very cool. But it's, uh, you know, that's pretty surface level. There are techniques where one really tries to merge with the breath or merge with the feeling of bliss, let's say, and you go into these deep absorption states. Sometimes they call them jhanas. Um, but uh, so there are practices like that that are all about getting into those really trippy non-dual states and so on. But I, I wouldn't say that's my main practice, actually. I'm kind of interested in how to, um, how to be comfortable at any level any state of consciousness, any depth, superficial surface level or deep, different kinds mm. to, to be, uh, if you want, facile at those different levels, rather than having a preference for a deep level, um, being facile at different levels. And then also a lot, of, a lot of times in those sits, it's a training and relaxing, you know, you, you feel things, uh, these weather systems move through the body sometimes, resistance sometimes is, is expressed by a certain tension in the body, subtle. Mm. So learning to relax the body as these experiences go through, uh, that's a big part of those sits for me. And also learning, noticing how these weather systems trigger thoughts, uh, I image, inner, inner, uh, inner sound or emotional feeling, as well as physical tension, et cetera. Noticing how these things relate and trigger each other. And mm -hmm. then if, um, I find that to be very fruitful also. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's what's going on in those sits generally it's me sitting there doing uh, some technique like meditating on the breath and it's pretty prosaic it's the basics it's page one of the meditation book done again and again and again and again that's mm -hmm. my style actually i really like those foundational things really getting deep foundation. when i used to play computer games my brother and i had a different style my brother's style was to he just get on the computer game he's very good at it and he would uh just charge through the game you know and figure it out as he went. My style was, you know, I'd sit there while he was doing that, read the manual, you know, <laughs> and that. And then I would, on the first level, I'd kill all the rats. I'd go into all the rooms and kill all the rats so that I'd get as much experience points as I could on that level. The next level, I'd kill all the skeletons, not just the, the route to the end, but try to get all the nooks and crannies. So then I get a little bit like, overpowered for the next level. And then each level, you get a little bit overpowered a little bit overpowered until by the end you're kind of cruising through the game because mm -hmm. you've put in all that foundational work. That's, I think, a temperament thing. That's a personality temperament thing. Mm. And my brother, of course, finished the games with his style, and I finished the games with my style. Look very different. Results the same, just a different temperament. Mm. So I have that kind of um, temperament where it feels very worthwhile to me to do the basic things uh, to. to uh, you know, a somewhat, ex well, I wouldn't say extreme. I mean, it's not really that extreme. If, you, if I think about really, really intense meditators that I know, I mean, they're amazing. But too extreme for me anyway, to a deep level. I like, that's my kind of style, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good too, because just keep it simple. Do what works for you. 
uh, and that's what meditation is about. It's not about trying to be like this guy or be like this guy. It's really just, you know, you're your own person. I'm my own person. So however we go through this journey, um, we're exploring ourselves and that's how you're going to do it. And you just have to go with what you vibe with. And if you don't vibe with, you know, whatever those intense meditations are, uh, then don't do it. But as long as it, I mean, what are we like doing all of this? Like, what do you think we're trying to really, uh, like, do you think you can reach a point where you just don't have a practice yet still are, because I've, I've heard people like Eckhart Tolle, he doesn't even meditate yet. You know, yet we can have the same conversation with him and come to the same conclusions as he does. Do you think you, there's a point where you just kind of, your practice is just not having a practice and kind of just uh, something else? Like your entire life is a meditation? Yeah, I mean, I, people say that. I've heard that. And there are some systems that, that have that at the end, non-meditation sort of, uh, or you could say that everything is meditation or, you know, in a way, yeah. or it yeah. could be a flip reversal rather than you meditating, you're, you're being meditated. Mm-hmm. That, uh, yeah. Okay. And I think there are people like that. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's, I, I like it. I actually like meditating. So I don't just meditate yeah. just because I'm trying to get to the point of etc. I mean, of course, that's, I suppose that's in there as well, but I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed doing it. I like the aesthetic of it. Mm-hmm. I like how it makes me feel while I'm doing it. I just enjoy it. It's like a hobby. Uh, it's, you know, like, <laughs> it's a little bit like that for me. So mm-hmm. I'm interested in it. I can certainly imagine a point where I become less interested in it from that point of view. I become less fascinated by it. Yeah, I can imagine that, that mm-hmm. in some period of later time I'd become, and I have more of a, uh, yeah, I could, but I don't know if it would be because I'd become so advanced that I wouldn't need to meditate. I think it would be more likely that I just um, lose interest to the degree that I have or refocus or have different priorities. You know, for instance, if I had a family, which I don't, like children and stuff, I, don't, I wouldn't meditate like, as much as I do now, obviously. Um, I'm in lockdown here in the UK, so I got more, I've got more time to do it. Yeah. It's just one of my, it's one of, I see this one of my hobbies um, in the sense that I enjoy, I do it because I enjoy it. Not, not, I don't feel it's a professional obligation or a religious obligation. I'm not a particularly religious person, although I'm very interested in religions, but I just, I do it because I like it, you know? Yeah. I'm the same way as well. And I think if you try to get something from it, even though I don't know any other language to really use, but if you try to get something from it, then you're missing the point. And I think if, you, like you said, if you just truly enjoy what it is, which is really nothing, essentially, it's really just kind of just reaching a sense of stillness. And if you enjoy that, then yes, keep doing it. But I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I have to do it for 10 or 15 minutes today. And if I don't do it today, then I'm going to throw off my spiritual progress. And it's like, no, it's not. It's just like, yeah, just do what you enjoy. It really is like getting back to what we talked about at the beginning of just you know, if you play guitar, it's just reaching that state. It's that, that state of connection. And if that meditation brings you to that state of connection to this world and everybody else, then yeah, keep doing it. And if you think it, it I mean, I don't foresee a way where I would ever stop a hundred percent. Like there'll always be points where there's sometimes for just reflection and just kind of easing the mind. I don't, maybe not as often. Um, but if there ever is a time where I, I stop, uh, I'm not going to ever force it. I'm not, you know, it's only going to be something that I feel because there is, for me, I go a lot of by feeling and my intuition. And I know there's times where I just have to, like, I feel like my, there's something in my inner being. I don't know what it is that says, all right, you have to just go sit down right now and just kind of take time and just mm. relax and reflect. And until that voice isn't present in my being, whatever, wherever that's coming from, um, then I'm going to keep meditating and keep doing this crazy ass practices that I do. Like if any, if the outside world ever saw me or anybody else doing Wim Hof breathing, they'd be like, what is this guy doing? Is he trying to like hyperventilate and kill himself or something? Cause it, it all of these things look insane to the outside world, but maybe they are insane, but either way it brings me happiness and it brings me to some kind of sense of peace. And like I said, connection. And until I lose that from these experiences, um, I'm going to keep doing it until, and when I get the message, I'll hang up the phone. And I think it is that simple. It's 
when you get the message from whatever you're doing in life, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Hang up the phone and move on to something else and grow in a different way. Yeah, well, we're in good company because it seems that all cultures, more or less, across all times, uh, one of the great hobbies of human beings, like I mentioned, is to fiddle around with these things. And uh, yeah, it, se it seems to be in us as, as human beings, you know, and uh, I think some more than others. You're definitely, uh, I think, uh, perhaps it sounds like on the out an outlier in terms of your, you know, curiosity and the application of that curiosity and the way in which you're uh, questing through these different systems and ideas and practices and experiences and so on. I don't think everyone is, has got quite that degree of openness that you've got. Um, you know, but uh, it seems that all human beings are at least intrigued. <laughs> yeah, somewhat. Because, I mean, there are others also that just aren't. And I want everybody to be on that wavelength of just, like you said, being intrigued, being like, hmm, well, what's that mean? Or maybe I should see life in a different light. And because if, if we don't reach that point of view and that, that perspective, the conscious perspective, if you don't reach that, then we don't grow. We don't, we stay where we are, which is this seems to me like a juvenile species that is still caught in its animalistic instincts of fear and war and just general insecurity as a whole. Uh, we're not going to ever grow from that if we don't full, if we just don't, just don't ask questions, if we just, if we don't uh, just about ourselves and each other and really just explore what we are. So yeah, I, I, I don't, not everybody has to do Wim Hof breathing or these crazy ass meditations, but I just want, my goal is to have others also be curious. And I bring on other interesting individuals like you that see the world in a different light and um, kind of just, you're on that vibe, you know, like everybody that I've talked to is on that vibe of just bettering themselves and bettering the world. And if I can kind of show and shed light upon the lifestyles that we all live to reach that point, then maybe it'll change just one person and make them see life in a different light or have them meditate for five to 10 minutes today. And that's how you, that's how we create that better world. It's just the small steps. It's just doing the little things. And like I said, man, it starts with curiosity every day for me is a new day in this incarnation. And I, I think I'm like, what's going to happen today? What, who am I going to talk to? What am I going to learn? Like I learned the beginning of this conversation that you live on a boat. I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't know you could live on boats in, in the middle of a river. I think maybe I'm ignorant, but I think that's pretty cool. Like just like little things like that, that just like expands my awareness and uh, level and degree, I guess you could say of consciousness to, uh, I don't know why. I don't know. I guess just because like you said, I like it. <laughs> just like you like meditation. I, I like just kind of diving into different subjects and people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that attitude is certainly going to um, is a very different frame to how a lot of people approach these sorts of topics, yeah. meditation or yoga practice, like the things that you do. Uh, you're right. A lot of people feel it's an obligation. If oh, I better get my yoga in or I get, I better get my meditation in, well, maybe that's okay. It works, but it puts a lot of people off. I think that kind of fing finger wagging. Yeah. You know, one more thing to do on the to-do list. But your, your approach of curiosity and uh, intrigue, very different. Sort of, it's r not restrictive at all. It's very opening. Yeah. It's, it's uh, just kind of like, that's how everybody, like, I think, like, that's how we all have to be, man. You know, because, like, nobody really knows anything, you know? Like, I don't know any. I'm just, I like to just go into it. Like, I don't, look, like, I'm just, I'm not a guru. I'm not any kind of spiritual icon. I'm just some g guy in America that likes to do yoga because it makes me feel good. And I know how to use a camera and a mic <laughs> and uh, just letting that lead the way. So if, any, if everyone else can do that in their own avenue, whatever it is, we can all just become these great beings and just grow together, you know? Um, I just see so much hope, you know, for human beings. And uh, it's just, yeah, it just goes, go with what you like. Um, Go listen to your intuition a little bit more, I would say. Uh, that, that voice that's inside of you, that feeling that's kind of inside of you, that it's kind of like right here. <laughs> There's something in here that tells you yes or no. It's like the devil and the angel on your shoulder. 
listen to that a little bit more and then we can all we can all become better people that's 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 my um my my motto for life <laughs> essentially yeah. mm-hmm. the gaskin the, the gaskin manifesto the gaskin <laughs> yeah <laughs> you mean um you mean haskins well because you're Gary Haskins. The, we, oh, the gas. Oh, we have okay. to like make, we have to make, if we're going to name a theory, we can't just call it up. We have to make some yeah. kind of transaction. The gas. The gas meta- I like that. I'm going to make yeah. that a thing. That's my first book. <laughs> That's great. Man. That's great. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, I don't really know where else to go from here on this one. Do you have, uh, anything else you'd like to get off your chest? Uh, any other questions for me or, Anything else? Anything else you'd like to plug on the podcast? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can finish if you'd like. I mean, I, I, I could certainly ask you more questions, but... Oh, definitely. Well, I mean, I'm well, up for it. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I'm curious uh, what a day in the life of um, Gary Haskins looks like in terms of, I guess it's the weekend now, so you, I don't know if you work, you work in the week, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, I have a regular job in the cannabis industry, the legal cannabis industry in Massachusetts. Um, So I go there and, you know, work with cannabis, medical grade cannabis during the day. And then I come home and then that's my, um, that's my practice. And I also teach yoga at a place down the street from me. Um, And that's it. Like in the time that I'm not earning my keep, I guess you could say I'm kind of exploring myself and kind of, uh, just trying to stay sane and remain peaceful as much as possible. Uh, but on the weekends, yeah, I do have the weekends off and I don't know, man, I just, I try to keep it low key, especially to, in today's world. I just try to, um, a lot, I've been working a lot on this podcast, kind of just reaching out to people, exploring different viewpoints of others and just, uh, yeah, I think I'll probably after this, I'll probably, uh, meditate a little bit just think about it and it's just i'm not i'm not anything too crazy man i'm just kind of just a regular dude like i said with a camera and a microphone that has a a, a curiosity for spiritual insights from from interesting people but a lot of my time is that it's when i'm not like have doing you know the, the the deeds of life whatever we have to do to survive i'm diving into uh you know old literature or stuff with crazy rabbit holes on aliens or or just like uh spirit quotes from gurus in the in the 60s and 70s or anywhere i'm just exploring the human condition it seems like at all times and you know all road they all roads of they all lead this to the same idea like i said before it's just unification it's just like i'm trying to it seems as though i'm trying to like uh re iterate to myself through my own findings that like yes like we are all one <laughs> and i'm trying to get to have other people in text tell me that we are all that uh that universal oneness because it seems if i was to just turn on the news or go outside or look at the world i'd be like oh it's just so much bleakness and seems to be darkness uh and it seems like it's my mind running away from that darkness to try and approach life in a new light to uh bring myself to a sense of sanity and in peace i guess because i know that's the truth like that kind of those insights that i chase are the truth and the the whole materialistic world that we've built up on the outside of just commotion and drama and just craziness essentially is isn't the truth so in the time that i'm not out there in the world doing whatever i'm doing i'm in my i call this my my office my study where I can kind of just reflect and reach that sense of peace. Mm-hmm. What about, uh, I'm interested in but that uh, you mentioned aliens, but what about um, relationships and things of that nature, like girlfriends, boyfriends, and so on? Are you, how do you find that plays into this side of your life, if at all? Um, it really doesn't. I have a girlfriend and she, uh, she lives with me. So like we're, she respects my time and, you know, I respect her time and it's really nothing to, I don't see anything of a detriment. You know, I wouldn't be with anybody that causes me detrimental, uh, you know, that's detrimental to my personal growth, I guess you could say, or just like being happy, <laughs> essentially. 
Um, but I think there are certain relationships that people can be in that will do that, you know, obviously. Um, and does she share your, does she share your passion for this, these topics that you're covering? Here? Um, I wouldn't say so. No, <laughs> kind of like a, in a different viewpoint, but no, I would not. I don't think it's in the same uh, perspective, but that's completely fine. <laughs> She's a, she serves a different um, purpose, I guess you could say. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, other relationships can not even just like, you know, interpersonal with, you know, like a, uh, romantic relationships. Other relationships can also just with your friends can also bring you down. I think it just comes down to being, knowing what kind of energy to surround yourself with that just doesn't hold you back, essentially. Mm -hmm. What about the aliens then? You said you go down rabbit holes to do with aliens and you've got an alien uh, t-shirt on also. Well, all right, if you want, this is like another hour long podcast. We can get on that topic. Okay, what's the, what's the like the one paragraph version of this interest? Well, I don't know. I just, I like to read other people's um, anecdotal stories of beliefs on the extraterrestrial and it seems to me that there is some kind of extraterrestrial species uh or species you know with a posture like there are other species out there of uh alien species and um it seems to me i think they are my insight is that these species of aliens aren't necessarily of this density like the third dimension that we are they're kind of like um interdimensional species that can come and go in our time space continuum at will. And it seems like they have like the abilities to just bend gravity and uh, they can kind of just appear and then disappear. At, and they have to be here. Like I'm not making any conclusions. I'm not saying that there is 100%, but to me, it seems like there's too many stories where there, it's there's too many like similar stories, and now we have videos too of craft, which is another whole other topic. But this seems like there's too many similar stories for it to just be some kind of coincidence of other beings and human beings being the only thing. I think that there are there are plenty of other beings that have been here, that do come here, and they are going to in the future. But that doesn't even like okay so this is holding time doesn't really exist to the species like we only see time linearly because that's how our brains perceive it but i don't think time is a thing to these extraterrestrial beings i think it's kind of like they're time travelers that can come at will but they know that if they interact with us a little bit too much they're gonna mess up like like you know the grandfather paradox with time travel where it's kind of like you know, if you if you travel back in time and you kill your grandfather, then how are you going to exist in that timeline? I think it, there's some kind of ounce of truth to that, where these kind of beings know that we experience time linearly. Um, so, I mean, they don't really want to get too involved. Like, I don't think there's ever going to be a gray alien on a Today Show because that would just mess up the the timeline, essentially. But I do think there are things here. But I, that's just one of my rabbit holes that I go down just for fun, just to kind of explore my being, like getting back to what we said. Ultimately, like ultimately, those extraterrestrial beings that I was speaking about, that's also us. Like just as much as I am connected to you and connected to all of this around me, I'm also connected to whatever those beings and spirits are or angels and demons, like whatever those energies are. Um, I see them as just other wavelengths that we can touch upon. Like that's essentially just a greater part of our being. And sometimes they may manifest themselves visually. And when people see apparitions or they see some kind of aliens, but essentially it's just, it's just us, you know, it's just like another part. Of, do you know what I mean by that? It's just an extension of this, this universe that we live in. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, it's, it's the, if, if we're all one, right that means we're also one with these beings. So it really doesn't even matter. It's kind of just me. It's kind of, I got, I got to stop. It's kind of just me just going down these rabbit holes just for my own entertainment. <laughs> Cause you've at the end stop. of the day. What do you mean you've got to stop? 
I just got to, I don't feel like it's really aiding my, uh, aiding me at all. It's kind of just like reading science fiction novels at this point. Like, you know, like sometimes I read, uh, I go on conspiracy Reddit, um, certain subreddits where like, uh, you can just, you can go on and on with people just extraterrestrial anecdotal stories or just like pictures that might be real or something like that. And it, it's just one of my interests out of my own curiosity, like we were talking about before, but I don't know if it really, me- it doesn't really mean anything essentially. <laughs> if there are aliens or if there aren't aliens, it really doesn't mean anything to the human, to me at least in my own growth at this point, unless they're going to affect us in a way that I can't even contemplate, uh, which I don't think they are. Cause like I said, that would mess up the space time continuum uh they didn't then they really don't matter at this point it's just kind of my own amusement <laughs> yeah i guess you still have to cook breakfast and go to work exactly whether, whether or yeah. not uh, fourth dimensional beings are hovering nearby <laughs> exactly yeah. that's really you, what it is have you ever had an uh, ex- an encounter or any experiences with something that you thought might be extraterrestrial well man i had this all right so we're gonna go there i had this dream one time it was an abduction dream and it's never felt realer in my life. Like I've had dreams before. I've had a dream. I had a dream last night and it was, just, I, I woke up and I was just like, Oh, whatever. And it's just a dream. But I had this dream one time where I was like transported to this table. People are going to think I'm crazy after saying this. I was transported onto this. It seemed like an operating table, like the cliche story that we all know, right. On this operating table. And there was three other like it seemed like it, they, it was like the cliche, like big round head, just robotic looking beings looking down upon where I was looking down from. And <laughs> this is crazy. This is like out of a sci-fi movie. They attached something to the back of my head right here. And um, it was almost like an information upload. They kind of just like attached it and just like got some kind of insight. And I woke up right after that. So yeah, whatever. That was just a dream, whatever. We all have crazy ass dreams. But I woke up with this the idea in my head, like right when I opened my eyes and it said to me, you are not a, it was the, I don't remember the exact words. It was like, you are, you don't actually exist in this world. You only exist in other people's perception. And I was like, whoa, I was like, why the fuck did that, well, sorry. Why did that pop into my head? Like, where did that come from? Like, why did I just, (laughs) why did I just imagine that I was on some kind of operating table with these aliens operating on me and then i woke up with this insight you don't actually exist in this world you only exist in other people's perception a- aka you watching me right now or anybody on the camera watching me and i was just like what what is that and that it, it struck me i don't i'm not gonna say i was abducted by aliens okay people i'm not gonna say i'm I, i'm not even gonna say that right all i'm saying is it felt really weird and I, ca- I came up out of this dream with this strange insight that I've never really had before because it kind of makes sense to me in a way like I don't I mean I'm not really like I'm more real it's almost like a sense of like I'm more real in the audience eyes and your eyes and everybody else around me than I am to myself and, I, and it was like a way to like kind of reorient myself and how I act and uh in how other people see me and kind of like, a, this was, this was way, years ago and, and how other, you know, kind of just like putting myself in other people's shoes and how they see me. And um, yeah, that's it. I've never really had any kind of waking experience of seeing a gray alien walk down the street. I've just seen videos, uh, I've read stories, but nothing in particular. I'm not ruling it out though. You know, if they want to visit me anytime soon, they can come and hang out. <laughs> I've always wondered, if i were to see one of these things everybody always gets scared right of ghosts or aliens or anything that's like out of the ordinary but what if you were to approach if these things were real what if you were to approach this thing and say i'm open let's go let's have a podcast let's have a conversation come on in and let's talk like is that i don't even know if that's possible like how can you not be afraid if that is the thing right i think i would be i would be completely shook by if i saw some kind of thing that wasn't of like earth like of extraterrestrial origin i think i would be scared just like anybody else but what if we could if these things were real just take a second 
and just be with this being. <laughs> Maybe that's the next step. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's interesting because a lot of, um, as you, I think, alluded to with, when you said ages of demons, a lot of mystical traditions or religious traditions do have categories of yeah. extra dimensional beings mm -hmm. uh, like angels and demons and so on, which are in the Christian, certain Christian theologies, they're said to be kind of around, you know, and you can't see them with your visible eyes, but they're in a kind of other dimension, I guess. Buddhism, they have, at least in later stage Buddhism, they have all kinds of dakinis and uh, bodhisattvas or in uh, sort of extra dimensional realms and water spirits and yeah. all this stuff. I mean, a lot of these, of course, that's a lot of these tradition, more traditional cultures do have these ideas, including Western cultures, ideas of sprites and imps and so on. That's very interesting, your, your idea about that. Have you ever tried uh, communicating or contacting them? Um, I know that there are some people who try to do that with remote viewing or with um, astral projection or with, uh, you know, like going out into a field with a flashlight and kind of making <laughs> Morse codes and stuff like that. Have you ever attempted to do that? I don't know. I'm not really in that belief. I mean, I read channeling sometimes. And uh, I just don't really buy it. That's not really like my thing to, I don't think. I, I mean, think, ETs, have you ever tried to, you know, contact ETs and so on? No, <laughs> I've never really tried that. Cause I think, like I said, ETs are of interdimensional and I don't know. I mean, maybe we do communicate and I just don't even know. And they send me messages, but I just, I don't, I don't, I think if we, if they are these beings to communicate with, I don't know if it's, to me, it seems like a communication that goes beyond words. I think it would be more of like a telepathic kind of energy transfer rather than, hello, how are you doing today? Can you give me the answer? Even though that is a way to communicate. But I think if we were to fully communicate with these beings, it kind of goes beyond this archaic way of communication using mouth noises and a flap of skin. It's, I think true communication if there are these things it's more of a sense of just kind of channeling in the energy rather than information but i'm, I'm totally wrong like i said i i don't know anything about channeling i don't really i'm really ignorant on the topic i'd actually like to bring somebody on here and speak to them about that but to me personally how i see it at this point i don't think uh i don't personally myself i don't think i could to sit there and communicate. I'm not open enough to be like, Hey, let's, let's try and talk or let's, you know, shoot, be me up to the, the spaceship or something. I just, uh, I just, that's just not where my, my pursuits lie. Yeah. Yeah. I guess <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day you're doing yeah. yoga, meditation, full-time job, a girlfriend. Yeah communicating with aliens <laughs> yeah maybe one too Add many, that to one too many <laughs> plays to spin <laughs> <laughs> that's funny then. Yeah. um i oh. mean what do you think do you do you believe in or do you just not subscribe to any belief you just kind of like to go with the flow um i've, I've never had an, that i'm aware of an experience with any extraterrestrial or trans-dimensional beings mm -hmm. myself um but uh, I think it would make sense that in this cosmos with so many different planets, there are other kind of life forms. I think, I don't know if it's, I know, I don't know if it's true or not, but I mean, I, I guess one would, one would imagine so. And as for all these stories of people have of encountering these strange, they have these strange encounters. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what to make of it. I wouldn't discount it. I wouldn't discount it because it's really hard to prove a negative. It's like, well, can you prove that they're, they're not having encounters with aliens? Well, I don't think you can. How can you prove? You can prove that if you can, or what is it? Is it delusion? Is it swamp gas? You know, <laughs> is it, what is it? You know, I don't know. So I really don't know, actually. Uh, it is very interesting, though. It's very fascinating. Um, people who, who claim to have had these experiences. And like you said, from a kind of science fiction entertainment point of view, it's it is uh, quite a thought to ponder. Mm. So they wonder, well, what if, you know, what if it was like that? Or what if this, and people have really elaborate theories, as you know, as you said, in fact, in systems of mm -hmm. different kinds of aliens and what they're up to and, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. 
I think. Well, I mean, I have no firsthand experience, unfortunately. So I will either. make that fortunate, actually. <laughs> yeah, me either. I don't have any, like, you know, seeing is believing to a certain extent in the human experience. And I don't, I haven't really seen anything other than that crazy dream that I just described. I'll give you the um, origin story, I think, of what happened. I think of our DNA is of extraterrestrial origin. Not 100%, though. I think we were morphed. This is really far out. This is just like an idea that I, you know, just entertain. I think we were morphed into these beings, kind of like hybrids with, uh, with apes, you know, chimps, whatever you want to call it, some kind of ape. And we, our DNA was somehow, we don't know how, morphed into with those apes. Um, and our other side of us is that divine side. We have the animalistic side of you know being an animal of being having these these instincts of survival and just trying to reproduce and then we also have our spiritual divine side that i think we've kind of lost throughout the years that we're now touching upon and i think extraterrestrial aliens whatever you want to call it god i think those beings are those those godly beings that created us and that's what we're trying to kind of unveil at this point like we come from i think that human being come from the aliens essentially when they say we are the aliens yes but i think aliens extraterrestrial spirits are all the same thing under the same umbrella and in us is that that's our essence that we're, we're trying to touch upon we're trying to see past our our animalistic instincts you know, of just that base level programming of just trying to survive and reproduce and touch upon that part of us that we've lost. Like, I think we were closer to that. It seems maybe thousands and thousands of years ago, we had that like kind of connection. And then when you read stories of the, uh, um, you know, this people seeing giants and these huge monolithic structures and the pyramids, like, it just seems like we came from a point of just like, I don't know, just like a different origin than from what we're told. And I think that origin lies in some kind of spiritual uh, beginning of that we can't even contemplate, we can't even describe, but like all of these practices and psychedelics kind of like are, we're getting back to that that oneness and that unity and uh yeah we are we are a part of that that alienness that extraterrestrialness it's just that we kind of um lost track of it and we just kind of like just become animals and i think that's the goal or the game of life is that is that through these pursuits we're figuring out who we really are um and who we are is a part of god we're a part of the creation. We're a part of the creator. We're not a hundred percent because we're the, we're the animals. We're also like of the material world, but the other part of us is that divine essence, that alien, that, that spiritual being that is inside of every single one of our consciousness. And um, that's what I think real, that's the real alien story. Like if you want to look at it, like just get past all the UFOs and conspiracy theories. I don't know any, like, I don't know. That's just for fun. But the real, essence is that we there's we don't know where we came from we really don't uh but we're kind of seems like we're slowly figuring out finding little instances here and there of you know touching upon slight truths now obviously we're never going to be able to know the whole thing i guess um and uh yeah that's the real alien story i see it as is that we are part of the extraterrestrial beings and maybe those beings are have been here forever with us kind of guiding us along the way and that's what these ancient scriptures saw and described and they they had no other language or terminology other than they are spirits and this is a this is a archangel and this is a this is a demon i mean you know, people didn't even know how to read back then. So how are they going to know what to describe these things as other than it's God, it's a spirit. It has to be right. So maybe it's like, you know, guardian angels, 
that's what it is. Maybe it's just some kind of guardian angels and we're just caught in the middle of this like spiritual extraterrestrial war that's going on. Who knows? I don't know. But all I do know is the real alien story that I'm trying to get my point across in with this is that we are our part of that, that alien likeness that we're talking about, that extraterrestrial origin. We are a part of that. And that's my only real belief. I mean, anything else is just me having fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. interesting yeah definitely this is a far out right. conversation man yeah it's definitely it went in some unexpected directions well you said that when your email you said you'll just you'd like to free freewheel it and see how it goes yeah, yeah well it's really interesting to hear about about your perspectives and and the, all the things you've researched and explored it's very fascinating thanks for yeah. having me on oh thanks for having you on as well i mean uh i, I mean do you have anything else you'd like to Get off your chest. <laughs> I feel like this was more of an interview for me. You turned this thing around. You were asking me <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, you just said a lot of dialogue, right? Rather than a, a one-way interview. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's how it went. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to uh, plug really. My website is guruviking.com, and the podcast is my podcast is Guru Viking Podcast, which is uh, in all the usual podcast places. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, other than that, which I expect you'll have that anyway in the show notes, other than that, Definitely. I've got nothing, nothing to plug particularly. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a pleasure having you on. I, you are a, um, uh, you're a different kind of guest because you're an active listener and there's not a lot of, like, I'm also an active listener. So I had to do most of the talking, it seems like, which is cool. I'm not like, this is like, I, lo I love the experience, but most of the time I noticed in your podcast, you were also the same way. You kind of just listen to people right and kind of just like let them do their thing which is cool that's that's kind of like what my goal is too so it's funny that you like we have two podcast hosts talking and it's just uh it's a different kind of dynamic than like if i was to bring on like some kind of uh you know religious scholar or a monk or something um so yeah this was a cool experience yeah. i really appreciate you coming on my pleasure i really enjoyed it thank you gary <laughs> thank you well uh viking guru Yep. Uh, is it called the Viking Guru Podcast? That's what it's called? Yeah, Guru Viking Podcast. Yeah. Oh, Guru Viking. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Dude. Guru That's okay. Viking. If you search Viking Guru, I'm sure it'll come up the same. Yeah, so the Guru Viking. Check them out. Good stuff. All right. Thanks for uh, tuning in, guys. And thank you again, Steve. Namaste.